Empires rise and fall, some lasting centuries, while others collapse in a blink of an eye. From ancient times to the 20th century, these empires would expand their domains, reaching far and wide from where the sun rises to where it sets, ruling over vast territories, controlling populations, resources, and trade routes. Yet, despite the ambitions of some of history's most powerful rulers, no foreign empire, not one at all, was ever able to conquer the Arabian Peninsula. Why is that? What made this particular region so resistant to the domination that befell so many others? The answer lies not within a single factor, but in a complex blend of the peninsula's geography, its people's character, and the strategic challenges posed by the way in which it was inhabited and settled. In this video, we'll explore these key aspects, unraveling the reasons for why this land has never totally fallen under foreign control. To want to invade a certain land, one must recognize clear-cut value and upside. So why would anyone want to conquer the Arabian Peninsula? What made this seemingly barren and inhospitable land worth the effort? For many empires, the Arabian Peninsula was seen as much more than just an expanse of desert. In every era, empires grew by acquiring wealth, resources, subjects, and territory. And for many, controlling the Arabian Peninsula seemed like a golden opportunity to achieve all four goals at once. In addition, its geographical position as the crossroads between East and West made it invaluable for regional, if not world dominance at the time. By controlling key trade routes, including the movement of spices, silk, frankincense, and other precious goods. Precious goods such as its widespread, inhumane, yet lucrative, slave trade industry. The Arabian Peninsula lay at the heart of maritime routes that connected the Mediterranean, East Africa, to the Indian Ocean, and the Far East, offering whoever controlled it unparalleled naval supremacy and infinite access to sea trade. However, these ambitions for conquest came at a great cost. The investment required in conquering and maintaining such control over a vast and inhospitable region was immense. It wasn't simply a matter of launching a military campaign. Empires would need to invest vast amounts of resources to sustain their forces in a land where the environment itself posed insurmountable challenges. Many decided that the risk was far greater than any reward. Nevertheless, some believed the potential rewards were worth the effort and dangers, hence attempted to conquer the peninsula, only to be proven wrong time and time again. From the Romans to the Persians and beyond, all found themselves unable to significantly infiltrate the Arabian Peninsula. A side note I want to highlight here is that there's a general misconception about the Arabian Peninsula, that due to its composition, greatly a desert habitat, it was unnecessary to control or conquer it was merely a crossroads. But this goes against the actions of many empires of antiquity, such as the Persian or Timurid empires, who necessitated the total conquest of the southern Persian lands, large swaths of lands also characterized by desolate environments. The Arabian Peninsula is huge. As a landmass, it numbers above 3.2 million square kilometers, or 1.5 million square miles approximately roughly the size of Europe, excluding Russia. And it's notoriously known for its vast and unforgiving terrain, which has, for long, served as a natural defense against foreign invasion. Dominated by arid deserts, the peninsula was characterized by scorching temperatures and a severe lack of water, all of which made sustaining military campaigns nearly impossible. Some of the most famous desert regions on the peninsula include the Dahna, Nafud, Al Jafura, and of course, the Rob al Khali, also known as the Empty Quarter, which is one of the largest sand deserts in the world. For foreign armies, traversing these desolate expanses was a logistical nightmare. Invaders from the north had to contend with the extreme heat during the summer months, where scorching temperatures would be the daily norms, even extending onwards to the very late evenings, thereby practically limiting any attempts of invasions for almost seven to eight months within any given year. Survival alone was a challenge during these hot summer months, let alone waging a successful military campaign. Armies that ventured into these deserts often found themselves lost, disoriented, and running low on supplies. 
even if an army could make it through the desert, then they faced the problem of maintaining supply lines. How could they provide for food and water for their troops when the land offered so little? The answer for many invaders was that they simply couldn't. Those that did manage to engage with Arabian defenders often found that the locals were more adept in dealing with the harsh conditions, giving the latter a decisive advantage. Invading forces often found themselves overextended and confronted with logistical nightmares, dwindling resources and plummeting morale. Many armies, greatly demoralized, were forced to retreat before even engaging with local forces. In the end, these environmental challenges proved insurmountable for most would-be conquerors, forcing them to abandon their campaigns and retreat, often with heavy losses. The second major factor in the Arabian Peninsula's resistance to conquest lies in the character and resilience of its people. The inhabitants of the peninsula were fiercely independent, with a strong sense of loyalty to their tribes and a deep connection to their homeland. The population was divided into tightly knit tribes, each with its own leaders and territory. These tribes were fairly loyal to their own, willing to fight tooth and nail, effusing a gallantry and nobility deeply entrenched into their character and identity. While invaders often had larger, better equipped and trained armies, the Arabian tribes, though, were notorious at using the land to their advantage. They knew the terrain better than anyone, and they used this knowledge to launch swift, decisive strikes against their enemies with a combination of fierce resistance, strategic brilliance, and a mastery of guerrilla warfare. No one consolidated leader existed, hence if any one tribe fell to an invader, nothing would be broken, neither morale nor unity. Cutting off the head of the snake to achieve surrender was of no effect. Even if one tribe or region was conquered, others would rise up in resistance, ensuring that no one single power could ever claim total control. This decentralized loyalty, social, and leadership structure made it nearly impossible for foreign invaders to subdue the entire peninsula. Throughout antiquity, one of the most important assets in the Arabian people's resistance was the Arabian horse. This magnificent breed is known for its endurance, speed, and intelligence, qualities that made it a crucial tool in guerrilla warfare. The Arabian horse was uniquely suited to the harsh conditions of the desert, able to travel long distances without water and performed extremely well in the heat. Arab warriors relied on these horses to outmaneuver their enemies, launching quick raids while disappearing into the vast desert before any retaliation. Cavalries in the armies of antiquity were the elite force that won or lost battles. The Arabian cavalry was feared and outperformed all others, conducting fast and effective strikes while enabling high mobility unmatched by their enemies. The legacy of the Arabian horse is one that continues to be celebrated today, and its role and use in the defense of the peninsula cannot be overstated. To know more about the myth and history of the Arabian horse, please check out a previous video that goes into great details about such a vital element of Middle Eastern heritage. The Arabian Peninsula was not just difficult to invade because of its inhospitable terrain. Its unique urban and settlement structure also posed a significant challenge to foreign invaders. The cities and communities of the peninsula were isolated from one another by vast stretches of desert, making it difficult for an invading force to establish a strong foothold. Even if an army managed to capture one city, they would face the daunting task of crossing the desert to reach the next one. The sheer distances between these urban centers made maintaining control of the peninsula a logistical nightmare for foreign invaders. One of the key complications facing potential invaders was that a large contingent of the peninsula's population was nomadic. Yes, townships existed in between other larger urban hubs, but these networks of townships were mobile. Nomads could move swiftly across the desert, appear in one spot only to then disappear into the desert with no trail or option for chase. The infrastructure and resources of these mobile townships were found within them, their defenses, their sustenance, and all that is necessary for life. Such resources couldn't just be taken and put to good use in a foreign invader's war machine. This combination of isolated cities and mobile elusive tribes made sustained control over the peninsula a near impossibility. 
The strategic complexity of trying to control such a vast and decentralized land as the Arabian Peninsula was a major deterrent for many empires. The cost of maintaining a permanent military presence in such a hostile environment, combined with the difficulty of dealing with mobile and decentralized resistance, ultimately made the Arabian Peninsula unconquerable. Yet throughout history, numerous empires still attempted to extend their rule over the peninsula. And though some came close, none ever succeeded. The Achaemenid Empire, one of the earliest large empires, tried to influence the region as early as the 5th century BCE, but their attempts left little lasting impact. While they may have exerted some influence on the edges of the peninsula, it was brief and minuscule. But let's look at some key events that some believe to have stopped certain aspiring empires in their tracks. Antigonus I, one of Alexander the Great's generals, launched a campaign in 312 BCE to capture Petra, the capital of the Nabataean kingdom. Antigonus saw the Nabataeans as both a thorn in the side of his efforts to control the region, as well as a highly valuable gem in his crown should he succeed. However, the Nabataeans proved to be far more formidable opponents than Antigonus expected. Not only did they successfully repel his forces, but they also ensured that the Macedonians would never again attempt to conquer their territory. One of the most famous failed attempts to conquer the Arabian Peninsula was the Roman expedition led by Aelius Gallus in 25 BCE. Acting on orders from Emperor Augustus, Gallus sought to conquer southern Arabia, which the Romans referred to as Arabia Felix. The region was known for its wealth and resources like incense and myrrh, and Augustus believed that adding it to the Roman Empire would significantly enhance Rome's prestige and power. However, the Roman campaign was sabotaged from the start by Sileus, a Nabataean leader who was in theory supposed to be their guide, but who deliberately misled Gallus' army, leading them through treacherous terrain on a wild goose chase. Sileus' cunning ensured that the Romans would fail by decimating their resources and will, and the story of his tactics became legendary across the region. In 224, the Sassanid Empire under Ardashir I sought to expand their control over the Arabian Gulf, including Bahrain. The local Namorites, led by Malik ibn Zayd and Namari, fiercely resisted Persian incursions, supported by other tribes such as the Banu Tamim and Abd al Qais. Ardashir I and his generals, Shapur and Bahran I, deployed their heavily armored cataphracts and totally relied on their superior numbers. However, the Arab tribes were faster in switching tactics and able to evade Persian forces while cutting their supply lines. During the Battle of Bahrain, the Namorites launched a surprise attack at dawn, catching the Persians off guard. Despite their superior equipment, the Persians were overwhelmed by the swift Arab cavalry and precise archery. Bahram I narrowly escaped and the Persian army suffered a significant defeat. The last of our sample foreign endeavors to invade the peninsula again comes from Persia, the Battle of the Qar, in between 609-611, which began when the Persian Shah, Khosrow II, demanded that a Nu'man, the king of the Lakhmids, hand over his daughter for marriage. A Nu'man refused, enraging Khosrow, who imprisoned and later executed him. Before his capture, though, a Nu'man entrusted his daughter and wealth Tahani ibn Mas'ud al-Shaybani, leader of the Bakr bin Wa'il tribe. After Nu'man's death, Khushro demanded their return, but Hani refused, leading to a Persian invasion led by the generals Humuz and Ja'ban. In response, the Bakr bin Wa'il tribe, supported by other Arab tribes, united to defend Hani's decision. Led by Hani himself, along with Al-Muthanna bin Haritha and Qais bin Mas'ud, the Arabs used their deep knowledge of the desert terrain in the Qar to outflank the larger Persian forces and claim a decisive victory. There are numerous other events in history that reflect the failed attempts by major empires to overcome the peninsula, proving that such a task was an insurmountable ordeal that none could achieve, and most didn't even want to attempt. The Arabian Peninsula's unique blend of harsh terrain, resilient people, and strategically positioned cities made it unconquerable. Empires tried, and empires failed. The unforgiving deserts, the fierce independence of its people, 
and the vast distances between settlements created an equation that no foreign power could fully control. Yet one moment in history stands apart, when the Arabian Peninsula was truly united under one common nation, a superpower. United because it was the Arabs themselves who brought together the various regions within the peninsula. Gone were the limitations, shortcomings, and challenges confronting foreign invading empires. Terrain was a non-issue as the Arabian people had already tempered their lands long ago. The collective population of the peninsula was one and the same, of the same spirit, of the same language, and of the same ferocity. But what worked most in their favor was a new message that had united their humanity, a faith with a clear and powerful mission. But that is a story for another time.